Fed wrapping up uh, its year yesterday, announcing its latest policy statement, latest summary of economic projections. We also heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell for the final time in 2020. And joining us now to talk uh, all things economy and what the future of markets has in store for investors is David Zervos. He's the chief markets strategist over at Jefferies. We're also joined by Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoche. And, and David, we have a lot of really interesting things to get to. I'd love to just begin by um, talking about yesterday's uh, statement from the FOMC, what we heard from Jay Powell, and um, how that changes anything that you were thinking about where the Fed fits in as we get into 2021. Uh, Miles, doesn't change much for me. I think the, the meeting was uh, probably the most boring meeting of the year, which is uh, what I told our clients. I didn't expect the meeting to give us anything new. I know there were some some people talking about twists and adding a few extra 10 years into the purchase program and the like. Um, not something I was looking for. It's very hard to see the Fed uh, even tinkering a little bit with things when financial conditions are in a really, really good place. Equities are uh, at record highs. It looks like uh, many of the sectors that are interest rate sensitive are doing great. Those that aren't, we expect to do better once the vaccine kicks in. Uh, in, in, in Q, probably by Q2. So I, I think, you know, the Fed just did a little victory lap. Uh, it was quick, it was easy, painless. The market might have had a little bit of disappointment for 30 seconds that they didn't buy a few extra tenure notes and then the tenure note yield went right back down again. So I, I really don't think there was much new. People are gonna talk a little about, you know, the guidance being stronger, but I, we knew the guidance was strong anyway. They told us in the last few SEP uh, projection forecasts, they weren't really preparing for liftoff until at least 2023 and probably beyond. So I don't think there was any new news at all uh, in the Fed's statement or the press conference. Gotcha. Uh, so David, obviously your takeaway for clients is that it was a boring uh, Fed meeting, but as we head into 2021, I, I am curious about how you're thinking about the markets in terms of like how you would structure the trade. I, I know one that we had talked about for a while was uh, spoos and blues. And I know back in March, we had a conversation around, um, you know, risk parity kind of entering the danger zone and then kind of shifting that trade. What is the trade structure for you today? Well, Julia, today uh, we shifted in April and May to away from short end treasuries as our hedge uh, because they rallied 150 basis points. So we were levering that part of the yield curve uh, in a vol adjusted way to, to hedge our equities, which is a classic risk parity trade. Once that yield structure in the treasury market moved, we actually moved into IG, which worked out really well. IG yields in the front end were north of 2%, uh, even two and a half. And those have come down to sub uh, 1% now. So uh, not only did our S&Ps work, but our hedge worked from March and April. So we've had a really good year in uh, what I called spoos and SIGs, SIGs being short-term investment grade credit. That said, there's nothing left in investment grade credit now. So we're kind of stuck. Um, I think there's two choices for risk parity investors. One is a hedge in the currency markets uh, for an event where we go risk off, which would be a tightening in financial conditions that's probably a mistake or unwanted, maybe a Fed mistake or a administration mistake or a Congress mistake. Um, that would send the dollar rallying, uh, particularly against uh, more of the commodity type currencies, Aussie, MEX, and the like. Uh, so maybe you could have a, a long dollar hedge to a long S&P position, or you just say, you know what, I got two great things next year. They both start with J, J Powell and Janet Yellen. And I just go with something like Spoos and J's, and I don't really even have a hedge anymore because I know these guys have figured out their backstopping techniques. Janet honed it during... 2014 to 2018. And, you know, Jay's really uh, come a long way from the uh, 2018 fiascos, uh, uh, or 2000, yeah, 2018 fiascos that, uh, that really at the end of the year caused some problems for us. So I think, um, you know, Jay's, Jay's in a good place for at least a year. He probably won't be the chair, in my opinion, next time around uh, with a new administration. But uh, again, I think with Janet and Jay, you've almost got a hedge you don't need to pay anything for. You, you forgot your Jay for Jello, David, uh, which you wrote about. Yeah, we could do um, that too. You, you, you resurfaced a, a note that you had written about Janet Yellen years ago, which basically said it's time yeah. to party um, with her back in the driver's seat. But I am curious when you're looking ahead to what she's able to do, right? Because you see a, a Congress right now that is really struggling to get stimulus done. So I'm curious what you expect from her in terms of 
you know, getting the ball over the finish line or whatever bad sports analogy you want to use, what's she going to be able to do in that position? Uh, look, I think Janet is eminently qualified to get in front of Congress, uh, talk about the need for certain types of stimulus. I, I think the way the Democratic Party has has couched stimulus is a little different than in the past. It's less about transfer payments and more about things like education, like health care, making sure uh, we have a safe and, and smart environment in the United States uh, and how those feed back into positive growth. It's, it's even less on infrastructure, which I'm quite uh, positive to see that switch. I do think, um, you know, making sure those that don't have access to education and healthcare get it. It's a huge boom, long run to growth for the U.S. So uh, I, I think she's going to be a good, uh, uh, she's just going to be a, a person that everyone can listen to and trust and doesn't come across as a hugely partisan person, even if she does have partisan tendencies. Uh, and I think she will work very closely with the Fed. In fact, one may argue uh, that the tre the Treasury has a, has a chance of silently even taking over the Fed uh, with Janet in charge. I mean, she's very well liked, very well respected. And I think the, the relationship between the Treasury and Fed could be as symbiotic uh, or even as, as close as it was before the Fed Treasury Accord in 1951. So you've got a, a Fed and Treasury with a combined balance sheet that could work together uh, in the event of any kind of downturn to, to sort of get Section 13.3 going quickly. There'll be no gains like what Mnuchin was just playing with a few of the facilities in the last month. So I just think the backstop is very clear. And I think she'll be a good, a good spokesperson for being sensible with fiscal policy. And that's a positive, at least in my book. So I'm, uh, I'm excited about it. I, I, again, I don't think we know where the risk off comes from. We didn't know where it came from last year. Nobody had you know, penciled in a virus, except for maybe a few people that were watching China closely. Maybe, maybe it's geopolitical. Maybe it's uh, something else uh, uh, along the healthcare lines, maybe who knows what it is. Um, but we get these bouts, and then we we expect action. And um, I think we've got two people, Janet and Jay, who uh, who know how to deal with these unforeseen events very well. And that's a, a pretty 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 much music to the ears of the risk asset markets. All right, in the Jays we trust.